It is 4 a.m. in the morning, which means it's the perfect time for me to welcome you all back to another episode of What Would Chobra Do? The series where we have been trying to follow the Pacific teams at Champion Soul and break down their upcoming matches, their upcoming opponents, and see what the core parts are that the team needs to watch out for to make sure that they get a win in their upcoming match. Now, obviously, uh, the results haven't been too great as we are down to one last Pacific team, DRX, and they are now facing elimination in the lower bracket of the playoffs. Took a very tough loss against Sentinels. I think Sentinels came very well prepared, and I think the doubt that some of us had had of can Sentinels keep up the form that they showed that was growing from FPX into the Gen G match, uh, Sentinels came out and said, yes, it's actually only going to keep getting better. Second pulled out the Neon after you know, not playing it at all this whole year. All in all, uh, Sentinels has now fully, fully recharged all the faith that all the fans have had in them this whole time. So credit to Sentinels. I'm, I'm actually very happy to see that. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled because obviously this, this is such a story team. You know, they came out kicking uh, right off the start of the year. They grinded through the offseason for all of that. So yes, all credit to that. We can talk more about that in the future. I think a lot of people have seen that they are the ones now putting their opponents into uncomfortable positions, right? It wasn't a fluke to beat FPX. It was not a fluke, definitely, to beat Gen G. And it definitely, definitely, definitely wasn't a fluke. It's not like DRX just suddenly folded over. I do think DRX tried to play it safer, starting with the draft and even how they were playing in the map. But I also think round to round Sentinels was forcing that out of them. So again, the better team won. But now DRX, they have to go up against Trace Esports, one of the biggest underdogs coming into the tournament, but a team that has flipped its image on its head, coming out as first seed from Group C over Leviathan, and then unfortunately meeting their grand nemesis from China, EDG, and falling down to the lower bracket. So let's start talking about the map draft. So, uh, I do believe that they'll have to do a coin flip, so I'm not quite sure who's going to be getting the first ban and things like that. But the, the initial ban should be pretty straightforward. Trace should be banning the Icebox. Uh, I, it's, this is their perma ban. It's a pretty easy tell, uh, I think. I mean, if they if they don't ban it, that'd be a very big surprise and it'd be a very big Hail Mary. But, um, obviously, it's not a map that DRX doesn't like. It's not a map that they shy away from, uh, and Trace has been banning it. So this is one of the reasons I think Trace is still probably considered a bit of an underdog, a pretty heavy underdog, I should say, in the playoffs, just because this is where map pull and things like that are really going to start to show their strength, uh, and Trace is a bit on the back foot. So Icebox should be a ban. The Lotus ban should be happening. Uh, Trace Esports, they go on an, I believe, undefeated run in Stage 2 on Lotus, taking down FPX twice in that process. Uh, they play the standard comp, the, the raise fade composition, but overall, this is a very, very comfort pick for them. I don't know if you do that. The only caveat is is that if DRX has full faith that they will just stick to the bread and butter that they've shown throughout stage two, and they would like to kind of bring this out just because Trace hasn't been playing in it, and they probably assume that it's a perma ban against them, there's a world where DRX tries to leave it open and baits Trace into picking it. This is something that we've seen a lot of this champions. In fact, I feel like it kind of happened in the Sentinels match as well. I was a little bit worried about that. But if DRX is confident that even though they've showed the chamber, maybe Trace not reading into it too much because they just assume that the Lotus is going to be banned against them. They've been brushing up on other maps that they want to target. DRX, they, they piloted the chamber composition pretty well, and they were able to actually break apart Fnatic, who came up with the meta composition uh, on that map. So... There's a world. There's a world, but I think, again, that's a bit of a Hail Mary mind game. Uh, I think there's still other ways that DRX can prep against them from what they've shown uh, by banning that out. Now, why would they not ban the Lotus? What else would they ban? Well, I think there is an argument to be had about banning out the Ascent, a map that they took down both Vitality and Leviathan on. Uh, and this is a map where Kai gets to play the Jet. I do think that they are a lot stronger when Kai gets to play the Jet. Fung is a very explosive player. Uh, his raise obviously leads the pack very well, but it it does lead a little bit to a bit more overheating, maybe a bit more disjointedness sometimes, whereas Kai, the way he's able to create space, I think he fulfills the whole entry aspect a bit stronger whenever he's able to play the jet. Obviously, there's other compositional changes around all the agents, but that's something that we've noticed. Because even, even when Fung is playing the entry, it's also what Kai is able to do on the Sentinel. Now, when Kai's playing the Duelist, Fung is oftentimes playing the Sentinel, and I think because he's not building that pressure of, I have to go in and create space, he's also able to maybe sometimes become even more explosive. So, 
I firmly believe that Ascent is a bit of a threat just because of that, right? This is a this is the agent swap that seems to bring out the best in them. And also, uh, they have been looking very good. So you could... I can see a world where Deer expands the Ascent over Lotus. I can, and then just study all the Stage 2 tapes. But we're going to go with the assumption that Lotus is banned. As normally on paper, that is what should happen. In that case, I think DRX uh, has a decent argument to pick the Sunset uh, and try to break apart what hasn't been working for Tracy Sports. Uh, this is a map where Tracy Sports, especially on the attack, seems to be not as fluid, not as flexible. Uh, whereas the other maps, while, for instance, like Abyss, Trace doesn't have a win on, I believe they played it twice during Stage 2, uh, and things like that. Again, you haven't seen it, right? And I think what we're, again, noticing is that Preparing for your opponent's tendencies and getting a couple early rounds like that, getting a couple more guaranteed rounds off of that, and then challenging them and forcing them to get out of their comfort zone as a huge boon. So while you may feel that, oh, well, our Abyss is very good and our Aven is very good, you've also now shown that several times, right? You haven't been changing compositions uh, and you have been playing with very similar defaults. Uh, and quite frankly, you tried that with the Haven and it didn't work against Sentinel. So I think you just go ahead and say, hey, Let's, let's pick something that we know, that we are pretty confident on, that we know how they play, and it's not a strong map for them. Let's go with that. So I imagine the Sunset will be picked up by DRX. Now, I think for Trace, there are two arguments. I think it's at that point left between the Ascent and the Bind. Um, I, I'm going to assume that they would pick the Ascent, quite frankly. But they could also be going through the whole thing of, well, well, we haven't seen their Ascent in a little bit, so maybe not. Or also, it is a comfort map for DRX, uh, even for Mako's Calling. Uh, so maybe we don't want to do that. Uh, and, you know, maybe maybe you go for the bind, right? Maybe you believe that you can still kind of battle through it. Uh, they do play the Cypher Lock composition on it. Now, I think this is really going to come down to how much faith this team has on the Cypher Lock composition, which they shouldn't have too much of. Because that is a composition that starts to really run its course once you've seen it a lot. So, I would... Okay, listen. From Trace's perspective, I think they should pick the Ascent. I just... I think they should. At which point, they will probably ban the Abyss. DRX has looked confident on it. Uh, you know, I don't know if you necessarily risk that against Elimination. Whereas DRX, I think you also say, we haven't seen their Haven. We thought we were confident in our Haven. I mean, Termi said in that mid-match interview, hey, well, we've really prepped our Haven. We've shored it up, and we're very confident this is a map to win. And it was anything but that. So uh, I think you just say, hey, we're going to ban that out. We know how you play the bind. We're okay with the bind. Let's go to bind if it goes to map three. So this is my guess, but I, I can see a, I can very easily see a world where the Ascent and Bind are swapped, and obviously there's, there's other aspects to it. But with this in mind, let's talk a little bit about some of these maps. Let's talk about Ascent first. So Ascent, we've seen it played by Tracy Sports, both against Vitality and Leviathan. They get a win on, against both of these opponents. Uh, Kai pops off whenever he's on this jet. Uh, his opping is very good. His movement around the map, and then when they're attacking, the way he's able to dash in and create space is very, very strong. We're going to start talking about the defense first, just because they're on the defense. Uh, but one thing I will say is... When you're up against their defense, it is much more about just knowing their defaults and kind of what does this setup mean for them, right? Is this a tell of a stack or not? Anything like that? Uh, or a set play? Because afterwards, it's much more about masking your intentions. And you could use their default against them for that reason. Uh, but it is much more about that, right? It's on the defense to try to get a read on what you're doing and adapt to that. Whereas, obviously, I think on the attack, while they could come up with new plays, that's when you really get a better feel for their tendencies and you can start to counter it and force them into an uncomfortable position. So just keep that in mind. But starting on the defense trace, uh, they actually go for a very, very early operator uh, on round three for Kai. Uh, so I imagine that'll probably continue to happen because it seems that he's very confident on it. So rule number one, try to make sure that that op doesn't go into his hands too early, too often. But right off the bat... Uh, what we are going to see here, we'll just keep this muted and make sure it's okay on oh, the right play speed, uh, is that you're going to see that they just set up very aggressively to push Kai out. Make sure that he has space. So they just wait to see, is there to rush or not? And if it's not, all right, here's the recon dart. Uh, and there goes the operator setting up over all the way on B. Uh, now, they even actually send the drone, right? So they're going to send the recon and the drone. So this is stuff that, 
you know, generally, unless you're going for a full all in, you should have someone here, they should hear it, they should see it on the mini map, uh, and you should get a very good read. But the fact that the Sova is investing so much util so quickly without any other reason, right? It's not like they heard util, it's not like they heard footsteps. Uh, that's just an easy tell. Now, this isn't anything new. This is true for a lot of teams, but we see this a lot for Trace. Whenever they're pushing out, it's guaranteed to be a recon. Whenever the op is not pushing out, it is not a recon, right? They're actually generally not pushing out unless it's the op, things like that. So it's also because there is a cipher on the other side. So obviously there's no like turret here that you're always going to try to take out. Uh, you have to fish for the trips. But overall, it's a pretty hard tell. And this is, I think, if you really start to break down Trace's matches, this is where you see, ah, okay, so they are still underdogs where they have good plays they have good understandings of the maps they do play uh they have pretty good teamwork you know they have a good understanding of macro but it's it's pretty textbook it's pretty systematic uh so there starts to become some more easy tells than i would say compared to you know some of the other teams that are left in the playoffs so that's rule number one you see you know that type of silver utility push out on b that means an ops there now sometimes maybe you try to trap the op but a lot of times that means that you can pressure elsewhere the other thing that almost never changes and we'll, we'll i think we'll see a couple uh, examples of when it does change later is that the alarm bot's going to be mid so if the op is pushing out if you want to trap the op or put it into an you know uncomfortable position or at least force it away the next thing you can do is instantly try to really pressure that alarm bot and pressure mid, right? Maybe you can go for a smoke here, drone out, break this with a shock dart or creep up and break the alarm bot. That's going to force this jet and the Sova to now have to pay attention to market. You can either go for an actual set play to pinch them or at the very least, that's going to deny them information here. So now they have to be watching from here and maybe here, maybe the Killjoy or whoever it is now has to watch at mid. That makes A weaker as well. So... These are ways where you see that Soviet utility, you think, all right, instantly we can pressure mid and A is going to get weaker, all right? There's, there should be a bit of a flow chart there. So that's one thing that hopefully if we do see a scent come out, uh, DRX can keep in mind. So moving on, we're going to see uh, an example of how to pressure that. So we see is Tex has set up the cam here. He heard the drone coming out. He saw the recon coming out. All right, this is all right. The ops coming out. Something's pushing out here. He already has a tripwire set up very aggressively. So that means Kai can't peek out. And Tex uses that to his advantage. He holds an off angle that you're normally not watching for right they would have to kind of be worried about that tripwire and texas is like okay this is really weird are you just waiting right outside of it this is a cheeky play by the way just traps him instantly uh and then meanwhile there's been some noise and pressure over on a so we start to see a rotate over the op has been pushed back but you realize okay your trip still hasn't been broken so it's not like they've pushed out fully so to make sure that his team has a bit of an easier time he goes ahead and breaks the alarm bat as well that is going to draw out the recon the recon comes out in time from trace so there's a good response from bianca but overall i think text plays that round perfectly getting the read on how does this work what is your plan uh, and how do I make sure that the rest of my team has an easier time? So very, very effective lurk uh, for the beginning portion of that round. Uh, and then I do believe, yep, it's just the operator left. So it's a forced save. Now, the next round we want to talk about is round six. Uh, what we're going to end up seeing here, I'll, I'll let it play out because I think we've got a couple seconds left here, is already uh, Trace, they've lost Hay Bay. So, okay, they are a man down. They don't have extra info. They don't have flashes. So it's already a bit of a tough round but lev they have a good read that this alarm bot is very consistently in the mid shock dart's going to break it and then you immediately send a drone out now take note of the fact that you no longer have this alarm bot if you're trace esports so you've already given up information on mid you've chosen to try to stack here because of some of this information that you're getting about the shock dart and the drone so they already read that util heavy but then there's no effort to try to confirm anything, right? They're they're a little scared. They're like, all right, when's this pinch coming? We want to be prepared for this. We're already a man down. Uh, and instead of taking risks to make sure that you're still getting the right read at 40 seconds left, uh, you know, whether it's Kai rotating over, trying to, obviously that's a little tough again, but you could send the drone out as well, right? You could creep up, send the drone out along with Kai peeking out mid, try to get some information that way. There are options for you to do so, but they don't they're just holding and they say 
now I'm not going to blame them because what they're doing is basically saying we've already committed to this. This is our life now, right? We're going for the three one. You're staying outside of the site so that if they are going into A, you're not getting swarmed. We're going to try to go for a retake. At least that means you'll hold this space so we can actually approach for a retake. That's all fine. But you can use this against them. If this is going to be their tendency, they get, you know, they try to read heavily into your drone. They put a lot of value and stuff like that, right? And you've ruined their alarm bot. So now you can try to tie them up a bit more. So this here is the attacking pistol round for Trace Esports. And what you'll notice is, I mean, first of all, Fung gets two kills in B main, so that's incredible. But then you're going to notice something peculiar about his positioning. A lot of times we'll have someone holding like here or here, right? Or here just to kind of draw people in, watch out for the rotates, anything like that. And look at where Fung goes. He's all the way in his own spawn. And Lev is going to try to clear him. They're checking. All right, where is this guy? Okay, we've cleared B main. We don't know where he is. Maybe he's wrapping around. Maybe he's hiding. We don't have time to go all the way. We got to come back in. And they already waste a lot of time doing so. Now, they, Trace does this. Fung does this actually against Vitality as well. It's not every single time, but if he's not immediately somewhere there, if you don't see the kill you until somewhere there, there's a good chance he's in his spawn. Now, what do you do about that? Well, that's up to you to decide. Maybe you always need to have someone coming through the flank. Maybe you need to have someone, you know, just making sure that they peek out all the way out here. Or maybe it's just the fact that you just instantly peek main and then you go for a fast retake, flood the site, and then you accept that if he's coming, he's, you know, he's coming. We Hopefully we still have uh, advantage in numbers. Uh, but those are things you're going to have to consider because that's that's a position he'll take to just waste your time on the retake. Another thing we see being done often by Trace on the attack is that they will go for the 1-4, but Fung will have a very heavy util set up at the entrance of B main. So even if you take out the turret, that way he can still check if someone's coming through or not, which means that he is going to hold a very close lurk. Uh, and we see this actually two rounds in a row here on this match, and we see it against Vitality. We're going to see it in future rounds as well. Uh, this is just how he plays. Like Even if they're going into B site, he keeps this util set up here. So that's just something to note is that even if you're breaking the turret that doesn't mean that they you know have no information now obviously you could hold here and he wouldn't know for the light of day but um he is going to go for this setup to try to punish you if you push all the way out so that is a tendency that fung has you can maybe even disrupt him even further by even breaking the alarm bot something like that right you could have someone spam the turret while a shock dart breaks the alarm bot whatever else it might be to keep him at bay to keep him tied up maybe you can easily go for a crunch even if you think it's just the lurk take out the killjoy makes it easy you have the numbers advantage there are ways to punish this because this is a very very this is the standard default that trace is going to use on their attacking side now, one more thing I want to talk about the attacking side of Trace Esports is that when they go for the B hit, there is a variation of tempo that you need to watch out for. If the smokes are not coming out right away and you hear, you know, footsteps and coming through, or if let's say they've already used the smoke elsewhere, maybe it's already one in mid and they only have one more smoke. A lot of times what's going to happen is they're going to smoke off spawn and then Kai, the jet, will use a cloudburst in this corner above stairs he will then dash through here and make sure that he's creating space and angles. I think if you really want to throw them off just a bit, there is a world where you could you know, just set up a cheeky nano swarm somewhere here. You know, it doesn't have to be every round, but every maybe every now and then if you let's say you have an op, maybe you have some other setup and you're thinking, okay, we have a little bit more insurance. I think something like this could work. You could even maybe put an alarm by here to prevent you know, if you're at the end of the day, if. Uh, or you could always just have someone watching that position, right? So the killjoy could just be watching. Oh, that's not how that works. Uh, the killjoy could just be watching for the dash in from stairs, right? And you could still have your nano swarms here to make sure that the extra backup's not coming through, maybe here and someone else's backside uh, holding on to that. Usually if it's going to be someone, it's going to be the Silva or vice versa. So this is a way you can also hold and just make sure that, all right, we know if they've dashed in or not. Now, the problem is, is if Kai does dash all the way into the corner, you don't have a clear shot from this angle. So that's the only trouble uh, is that you're at the end of the day, you're just going to have to kind of give up that space because now they have a crossfire on you. Uh, so this is just something to note. You don't have to 
kill him by just because he dashed in there but you do have to have an answer because otherwise the rest of his team is all going to be able to kind of flood into the site pretty easily in front of a switch uh before they choose to you know swarm the site so I just want to make a clear note that this is a common position that Kai has used in the previous two matches that they played in the group stages. Now let's talk about Bind. Let's talk about their defensive setups first. This duo, the Sky and the Deadlock, very, very common uh, for Trace Esports. This is kind of, I think, just their starting line is, hey, we're going to set up traps and we're going to have uh, we're going to have control of Hookah. And if they come in, we're going to just blast them. They're going to get stunned. They're not going to know what to do. Now, this is a good way to use these because here's here's what's going to happen is sometimes people will creep through, right, to get into the site. Now, they, they will be creeping in, so they won't trigger the trap immediately but if you are constantly jiggle peeking and you can get them to shoot use util things like that jump run whatever else it might be that's how you want to use the Denlo uh, denlock sonic sensors is to basically trap them into a fight and force them to trigger it it's basically a somewhat on command fault line right it's an on command stun that you can use and abuse for your own advantage uh, and that's how they use it a lot which is good i mean i'm glad that they have a decent understanding of how to use deadlock and heavy seems to be pretty solid about it but it is just important to note that this is very common because what has happened in their bond game so far is that once the team opponents realize that this is happening, this starts to get punished and then they have to kind of get out of their comfort zone. Now, what does this also imply? Well, it also implies that if they are holding there, this area is relatively free. Now, they could have traps here as well, you know, or they could have set it up at the beginning of the round and Sky is holding this and then you go back, then this trap wouldn't quite be there. But either way, like there's, there's a world where they have information on it and you could have a guiding light go through. You could still hold those timings. But my whole point is, is that that means that a jump peak here early on aggressively almost never happens. I'll tell you when it happens. This is how you know they're going to go for jump peaks. As if the brim is over here, and you see Sky Smoke's coming down nice and early. Sky Smoke here? Oh, they're peaking B. They want control of it. Maybe they have someone planted here, and now they're going to have extra sonic sensors somewhere along these lines, right? Wherever else it might be. That's how you know they're peaking it. But unless that Sky Smoke comes in, they are not, they're not usually trying to go for early jump peaks and then timing, you know, time their guiding lights and things like that. So this is something that I think early on, if Bind has played, what you can do is abuse this early on in the half to say, are you guys really not going to put anyone here? Because we're just going to get this for free, like every time, which gives us control of the teleporter, which at that point means that I just have to worry about the cypher util that's going to be over in showers, as it, you know, oftentimes is. So, you know, you're just going to have to worry about stuff like this. Now, Kai does play very, very aggressive setups sometimes over in showers, so... It is going to be a bit of a pain, but you can always have someone here just to make sure that they don't peek out either. So this is something I think worth abusing early on to kind of force them to say, hey, this whole trap of like trying to get cheeky kills, not going to work. We're going to have to play more standard, a bit more spread out. And if they're spread out, that is where the Dunlock Cypher suffers a little bit because you want to set up traps. It's all about traps, especially on the defense, uh, which I, which is why I will always argue that it's actually not a stronger comp on defense. It's a strong comp on post plant, which is, again, a very big caveat because that means how do you get to the post plant? You're going to have to take a lot of contact. But that's the point is that now you're going to have to wait for other traps. Now, that means their next kind of default setup is going to be sonic sensors on drops on the entrances just to punish uh, any execute on B. And then it's, it kind of acts as kill traps. So you'll just have to watch out for that. If you're not seeing Sonic Sensors somewhere over here, if you're not seeing, you know, the Dunlock and Sky over here, then there's a good chance that B, like you can't leave this as your, hey, there's 20 seconds left, let's rotate through the teleporter and just rush in, because then what'll happen is you will take your merry way to go all the way in, and then bam, you are now stunned, uh, and you're probably dead and you're running out of time to plant the spike. So that's the only thing you'll have to watch out for is that if you don't see any early sonic sensors and no other signs of like uh, the jump peaks or anything like that, or even if you do see the jump peaks, this, there's a good chance that the, one of the sonic sensors is here just because that means it's probably not here in hookah. So then you will want to figure out, okay, do we want to like name this? Do we want to make sure we have a bit more time to go into B? What else do we want to do here? 
Do we want to take slow contact into it? Make sure someone's actually cleared the site. Whatever it takes, that is something you'll have to keep a note of. Now, another thing you do want to watch out for is that wherever the deadlock is, there is a grave danger of a gravnet trap being set up, even on defense. And they will be using this to try to trap you into kills. So maybe you get a little bit of early contact. You Maybe you've traded some guiding lights, right? And you say, okay, these guys are here. They only have that one sky. They don't have great ways to check if we're here or not, so let's creep up. Well, now what could happen, in the worst case is there's even a sonic sensor here. But even if the sonic sensor is not here, what oftentimes is going to happen is they're going to throw aggressive grav nets to go in and make sure that you're all stuck there. And either they will double swing out, or maybe sometimes they're going to have the rays over here as well. And obviously then the worst case is that the paint shell goes off right on top of all of you. Uh, and there can be a lot of panic, especially if you haven't played against a Denlock that often. So what does that mean? Well, I just realized the colors are different. So the green is Tracy Swords. But if you know that there is a Denlock nearby, what you should be doing is making sure that you keep some good spacing, right? So you want to be pretty spread out. Normally, you want to be bunched up to make sure that you can like immediately swing and trade. But against this Denlock com combo, maybe you know two people just in case. But the next people have to watch out for the actual push that's going to be coming. So let's say it's just the brim here. Then maybe you're just holding a far angle to make sure that you can still get them on the swing. But you're making sure that you're not also just stuck here on top of everybody else. I, I think this is going to be pretty crucial if you want to just punish them. Because here's the other thing is that if that doesn't work... Uh, the deadline doesn't have much going for her. So that's just another thing to keep note of. Uh, one more thing is, let's say they go for this early guiding light, you know, and they, they try to pressure and you're like, okay, they're jump peeking this, uh, but you wait for that util to dissipate. They're not going to just keep spamming it. So then you, you push them back, or at least you challenge them and they can't peek that anymore. I have realized that Tracy Sports is not very aggressive about their util and re-clears. Again, part of it is the problem is this composition is because you only have the one smoke, so you can't just keep dumping your sky smokes over here on uh, B long. Uh, but you don't have another initiator, so you can't just go off of your cooldown again to re-clear. So the only way to really re-clear it is, again, something like a, uh, yo, let's trap him with a grav net. That's about really the only option you have. Otherwise, if you want util for retakes, then you're going to have to save it. So... And they don't play confident enough to just constantly like double swing it for a reclear and confirm information. Trace is pretty passive once they lose information on the defense you're in bind. So again, another thing you can abuse by just saying, hey, we just have to push them back initially. They don't have the util advantage that we do. Then we can go in, start to maybe clear out potential sonic sensors uh, and see if there's any movement on the other side of the map. Okay, now we'll have them on the correct uh, color here as enemies. Let's talk about attacking defaults. What's the attacking setup here? First things first, uh, and before we talk about setups, first things first, the best way to combat a cipher lock composition on their attack is to make sure that the spike does not get planted or it doesn't get planted with a 5v5. You want to do the numbers because guess what? If they're planting it on A, uh, we are going to see a very, very easy barrier mesh just slowing the retake down here. If it's on B, it's going to be somewhere. Uh, there there are just annoying things. That's what this thing is built for. And then and then you've got sonic sensors and trips and all that. So that may, the retake gets a lot harder against the cipher lock composition. So if you can... Filling the site, right? Denying that, delaying it even further. So maybe the barrier mesh has gone down, but you now you're delaying it with mollies, things like that. That's something to note. But aside from that, let's talk about how they start the start each round. Uh, generally, there's three big groups of defaults that we've seen from Tracy Sports so far at Champions 2024. Uh, the first is when they're looking to hit B. At that point, Kai is going to be lurking next to showers, and they get to have B-long control. Very, very standard setup across all the different compositions. Gives you full control of the teleporter here, right? Because now you have control both sides, so you could always do a late rotate. Uh, if need be, Kai could try to start pushing in, and he could start to try to clear all the way right up to the site so that you know you can actually at least get into the site, things like that. Uh, so it's a very standard setup, but the important thing to remember here is uh, very often if this is what they're starting with, like let's say you immediately see a very aggressive guiding light coming in all the way B long, that generally is going to indicate, unless it's a curveball, that there's going to be these three members here and the deadlock is going to be watching Hookah. 
This allows the Denlock to now not only maybe watch out for TP plays coming in and put up a Sonic Sensor here and things like that, but gives you a good angle to now set up your other util for your teammates, right? You can get an easy toss of your grab net to the back. Uh, you know, maybe you want to change it, chain it with paint shells, things like that. You can just toss a simple barrier mesh if you want all the way deep, something like that. Uh, it gives you that opportunity instead of all having to line up and the deadlock having to like shimmy all the way in to start to throw their util. So the deadlock usually waits until the teams push in and the deadlock starts to creep in uh, and you try to get a clear that way. Now, during all of this, Kai will generally eventually slowly, slowly, slowly move up uh, and try to get some clear space over on showers. Uh, and what eventually happens is either he gets full control of it early or he'll slowly just check it and then eventually... He makes his way over to a short. This way, he can not only still create space on A if need be, but he can also TP and join his teammates afterwards. So you always want to keep note. Their, their lurks go very long. This is the same thing in, on Ascent as well, even with Fung. But if they go for these 1-4 setups, their lurks like stick around for a long time. So another thing you want to consider. The next setup is oftentimes going to be this setup so it's just going to be a pinch on the a site so if the, you spot the raise on a short generally it's going to be a hit they're looking to have a pinch onto here this works out pretty well for them because as soon as they get up to the site they can block off the back of site any more extra flood ins uh, obviously you're going to have your smokes here so now you've cut up the front of the site uh, and then you can kind of shimmy on over here pinch showers Meanwhile, you're already planting the spike. And last but not least, when all things fail, uh, generally we will sometimes have just a very, very spread out, slow default. I've only seen it kind of happen after timeouts uh, from Trace so far at Champions. This is not their usual go-to. Uh, it's only when they think that they need a better read or they want to figure out, is the opponent going to do something special, something like that. So this is their response. But otherwise, it's kind of a stack on B long, lurk on showers, or stack on A short. And then we go in and barrier mesh goes up on the back of site. So what can DRX do to combat this if we're playing bind? Well, first of all, at the end of the day, you're going to want control of B-Long and showers, right? That's generally what you want to do on Bind. So something that you can do is make sure that th this composition needs to take contact at some point before they get onto the site. So you can have so you can have something like long range sight lines here, you know, some early paint shells if you get some contact just to lay them even further, then you can have backup set up. Uh you could I actually think it might be worth it to try to actually hold some hookah control against this composition and the way Trace plays it, just because, again, if you're able to deny the deadlock utility to get set up all over the site, this does make it easier for the rest of your team to not only flood in here, but wrap all the way around. It gives you more options. Now, generally, you want to hold B long just because of the teleporter, but I think holding onto hookah in this case and just waiting for the moment the deadlock comes in, because a pinch from here is not as easy. So... It takes a lot longer. So I think this is something you want to consider as well. The other thing to keep note of against this composition is again, they don't have that much util. They they want to save, like here are all the things they want to absolutely save until the spike is like pretty much guaranteed to go down, right? So you're going to want to save this. You're going to want to save the incendiary. Uh, you will probably want to save at least one sonic sensor. Uh, there is a good chance you're going to want to save at least one smoke until the post plant. Uh, and then there's a good chance that you'll want to at least relocate one of the traps. You'll probably want a cyber cage as well. Like these are things you need, but the bare minimum is this, right? This is stuff you bare minimum need, which means that to get into the site, on your way into the site, you have the following options. You can have... You can have two sky smokes, you can have a grav net, and then you can have your guiding lights and your trail blares here. Quite frankly, I would say that you probably want at least one guiding light in the post plant, but let's just say, let's just say they're like, all right, we can have a good setup. We got some cheeky barrier meshes and things like that just to keep them at bay. This is how we're going to drag this out. Okay, cool. Um, and then, I mean, the cypher is the cypher's kind of free to use whatever he wants on his way to the lurk. Like if it's a successful lurk, it's all the more value, but that's not 
like this isn't disrupting anything this isn't going to create insane set plays i'll put one cyber cage here just because okay that can add some fake pressure with the with the lurks this is a very weak oh and then hold up you will have the raise util now generally though if you use this to get in, see how weak the post plant looks. If you use this in the post plant, see how weak the entry looks. So overall, let's let's put the raise stuff in its own here. This right here, oh this arrow. This right here looks pretty weak to me. And it really looks like even if you add in the raise util, it does feel like you only have one and a half chances to get into the site with util so we go back to my point generally for this composition to be very successful you're gonna need to take contact something you can do to really really mess up their attack if you have a composition that let's say has either double controller or double initiator is constantly pressure them with your early util let's just assume it's a sky right Pressure them with your early util, because otherwise, because Trace, again, they don't do a lot of dry peeking and dry contact. Not too much of it. They're like, all right, we're going to use our util to get information. This is how we do it. We have a set play. Again, this is why they're a little different from a lot of the Chinese teams. But if they're going to do that, send a guiding light. Push them back. What do they have to do? Maybe now they have to use uh, their Churro Blazer to clear this. Okay. Now we've traded util for util. Maybe they have a little more time, but now... Uh, let's say your poison cloud goes up. It's like, okay, well now they've been denied information. It goes down, but you're playing double controller. So you put another sky smoke here. All right. They're still wasting time. Now they have to kind of figure out where do we go? Do we want to use util to go somewhere else? Maybe they use util to see, all right, well, did someone push out here? All right. That's another guiding light down. So now already on the entry, you're going to, you're going to have, well, this was, this was our smoke, right? So you still only have two smokes. So they have one chance to do a set play to come in, but then you could have something like a snake bite delaying them. Uh, and you could have your own paint shells. And then at that point, if they're, if they've just used their util, they don't really have any ways to get in. Like if you draw this util out for them to enter the site, they, they have literally no option, but to dry paint because this barrier mesh is not helping you get into the site, right? A sonic sensor not going to help you get into the site so these are the problems of the slavery lock composition where you really just have a bit of an all-in factor and they have to work with that so i even think not only is it just saying hey let's play a little war of attrition and have a stalemate and we're just going to keep throwing util at you so you have to use whatever util you have to clear areas to get up to the site that's one way to do it but another way to do it is just to have you know some tactics of set plays to push out from one area because they'll still need to usually use most of these to at least secure the site at which point you can say okay well we still have some more util left and now we've caught the flank so the spare mesh not as impactful great already nullified another big part of the entire point of your composition uh, and as I was looking at this, the only other thing I want to note is uh, something that we've seen a lot of people kind of not pay attention to is the fact that the grav nets do go through the wall. So, uh, you know, stuff like they throw it here and then the raise bounces in, or even on the retake, they throw it here and you get caught here, things like that. You just need to watch out for that grav net. It can really mess up your tempo and your timings. Now let's talk about Sunset a little bit. Uh, first of all, this has not been a very convincing map from Trace Esports. I believe they've played it in all three of their matches so far, uh, and it hasn't looked that great. One big thing is it's not they're not that fluid, which tells me they're not as comfortable on this map as some of the other ones we've seen them play. In fact, probably a lot of teams aren't as fluid as they could be on the attack here on Sunset, but that's a topic for another day. Uh, but one thing I want to note from this round, and we're you know you'll see it in other rounds as well is the fact that if there's ever going to be presence in mid, you know, a lurk, a pinch, anything like that, a lot of times it is two people. It is both the Cypher and the Omen. It is both Kai and Lo King. So that's important to remember because this time, first of all, they're going to go very, very deep. So that's already a bit of a curveball. But it's important to remember because if you spot only one of them and you think, all right, we took care of the lurk, that's not going to be it. There's oftentimes another one you will have to watch out for so that's just something oh this is actually going to end terribly because this is a round where we're going to see kong kong get the ace so we might as well watch it because it's a nice little it's a nice little play here from kong kong with a little thumbs down as well just having some fun 
So props to him with the ace. But basically, we see this in other rounds as well. Maybe they already set up for a deep lurk. Uh, and then we're going to see them have both of them in mid if it's a pinch from mid to B. A lot of times, it's two of them in mid as well, even if there's a main force uh, going through B main. So just something to note of even if we found Kai, doesn't mean that's the end of the lurk. Now, when it comes down to the A site, uh, generally, it's always going to be a split. Now, this may seem like common sense just because it's like, well, it, of course, it's going to be a split. Like, you don't want to just all funnel through. But what I mean is it's like literally always going to be a split. Like, it's almost literally always a pinch. It's not just, uh, for instance, like a cypher just watching here. It's like there is always going to be people moving in from both directions. One way you can combat this is you can always wait for some of the util and then try to push back out and meet some of the guys that are coming in uh, from a short, right? And then you can push them out. And that way, even if you give up the site, now you hold the flank, something like that. That gets rid of the cypher nice and early as well. Uh, there are those options. Now, other ways you can do it is just always making sure uh, that you're watching both angles, that you've got that set up. Maybe one person's uh, you know, sitting on on site and then one's watching all the way from the back alley, things like that. Uh, there's there's ways to play around this, but I just want it to be very well known that it is almost always going to be contact from both sides, not just util, but contact. And something I think I've gathered from watching all of the different maps we've talked about today from Trace Esports all three is the fact that they have some good set plays, they have decent macro, they have the the image of how the map should be played in their head, but therefore, they're very scared of taking dry contact or using util early elsewhere, which limits a lot of their choices. So it's not that they're just gonna run, you know, willy-nilly into contact and die, but therefore they'll just be like, well, we don't wanna use this util here, so we're not going there. And that really limits their options so there's i think the process of elimination for where trace's head is at is actually a lot simpler than it is compared to some of the other teams that are left in the playoffs and you can use that to your advantage let's say you push and they you know let's say they're trying to push a and you push them back with the fault line and now you're saying okay we hear the spy cam and things like that over on mid take b main control easy peasy right maybe even pressure them in fact i think pressuring them again i this i'm i I say this with a small disclaimer because obviously you don't want to overheat on defense, but pressuring them a bit, you know, just whether it's with util, maybe taking a pot shot, peeking out, you know, from just for a brief moment on an angle, something like that, uh, it pressures them a lot because now they're going to think, oh boy, well, if we want to go mid to B and we want control of B main, do, do we have to use util? Oftentimes, if they don't, their last resort is let's say they're going mid to B, right? So let's say the main force is coming in through here uh, and let's say they successfully get in. Their last resort often is Kai or Fung, whoever's playing that Sentinel, go for a very slow lurk. And so they just they shimmy in much later for a pinch. So that's the only thing you would have to worry about. But again, that already puts them a lot more at risk. So they're going to try to save their util for the set plays they have in mind. They have a playbook that they want to go through. And again, you can use that to your advantage by pressuring them to force them to have to use util early or you're playing blind and you're playing at a disadvantage. Listen, all in all, DRX should be able to win this match. If you're playing that draft, if you're playing these maps that we've seen from them so far, you should be able to beat them. DRX should be able to beat them. They, they, I'm not gonna say it any more times because then it's gonna sound like a jinx, but DRX should be able to beat them. I feel like the process of elimination, again, the flow chart is a bit more apparent. Trace is scared to take chances on using util and getting you know clearance early working the map earlier as an advantage to mask their intentions that's not something they do very well especially on the attack uh, and especially things like bind i mean that composition is already a bit all in so these are things i think drx should be able to study and come up with i hope that they use that to their advantage rather than you know going into a map where they're just like oh we just think we're better even if we don't have any recent data because who knows what happens then but that's it for the breakdown here on what would Chobra do. Those are my thoughts on DRX's match, upcoming match with Trace Esports. Fingers crossed that DRX, that Pacific can still have a team left at Champion Soul. And hopefully they can go far. Because if not, it is going to be an event held in Seoul with no Pacific teams left. And that would be a darn shame. If you enjoyed this video, a like and a comment is always, always appreciated. And of course, if you're new to the channel, 
If you like some of the breakdowns that we're doing, if you like the esports discussions we're having around Valorant and in the future other games, make sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos in the future. That is it for now. There are no watch parties, by the way, for this weekend because I'm actually going to be on site for an on site activation outside of the venue. So no live watch parties, but if you're in the area, definitely drop by. I'll see you next time.